I'm back. Uh, I had to get my cup of coffee here. So if I start talking really fast, it's it's probably the coffee. Uh, fun fact, you can take these videos and you can play them at 50% speed. And I sound like I'm drunk. So if you get bored, I guess you can do that. I uh, appreciate you hanging in there in a very, very abstract uh, video, the last one. Uh, very hard to kind of wrap your mind around. What we're going to try to do in this one is we're going to take all those rules that we gave you and we're going to try to make them make a little bit of sense. You know, where do they apply? So we're going to get some applications on this one. And I hope you can kind of see how it all comes together by the, by the end of the video, hopefully. So let's go ahead and get started on that. So now that you know something about the rules of how the, elect, uh, how the electrons, uh, the energies they can have, and therefore their average distance away from the nucleus, those are analogous to each other. Uh, now you can start writing what we call electron configurations. And electron configurations show the total number of electrons and their energies. So each of those electrons has a particular energy, uh, and, and that's what electron configurations tell you. Uh, with electron configurations, you need to write something called the order of filling. Uh, the order of filling is a list of the sublevels uh, or subshells, what we call them, I guess, uh, listed from the lowest energy subshell up to the highest energy subshell. Uh, why do I have to do that first? Well, think about it this way. Let's say, for example, uh, you came to school today and you're coming to chemistry class. Where'd you park? Did you park over in the, at the Shap Center? I mean, it's a really big parking lot. There's plenty of spaces over there. Why didn't you park over there? Well, it's not very close to the building. You got to walk, right? Okay. So where did you most likely park today? Well, you probably parked over here at the Fox, uh, the Fox uh, Science Building parking lot. Why? Because well, it's closest to the building. Well, it turns out the electrons are a lot like students. They prefer to be in the lowest energy state possible. So if an electron had a choice, it would want to be in that 1s subshell. First energy level S subshell, because that's the one that's closest to the nucleus. The problem is you can only fit two electrons in there. All right. If I've got 57 electrons, I can't fit 57 electrons into two spaces. And so the rest of them are going to have to do something else. So let's say hypothetically you got to class uh, yesterday morning and the entire parking lot was full. I mean, there were, you know, 300 cars, uh, spaces out here, and every single one of them was full. What are you going to do now? You going to go home? Some of you probably would. But what would probably be the next thing you would do? Well, you'd drive to another parking lot that was relatively close and look for a space there. So maybe you end up over here at the tennis courts. Maybe that one's full. So maybe you end up over there in the, uh, the health sciences uh, parking lot over there where the nursing program. You know, if that doesn't work, you know, you move out a little bit further. You know, you might end up over at the Shap Center by the time it's all said and done, but that's not where you're going to start, right? Well, it's the same way with electrons. You know, if I've got, uh, say, 47 electrons uh, to put into my spaces, the first two are going to go into that, that 1S subshell, because that's the lowest energy. But once I get two in there, it's full. I can't put a third one in there. So number three is going to look for the next lowest subshell, and it's going to start to fill it, which happens to be the 2s. Well, once that's full, then it's going to, you're going to look for the next subshell, okay, and so on and so on and so forth, until you run out of subshells, or run out of electrons. You won't run out of subshells, but you will run out of electrons eventually. So again, it's kind of like parking cars. You just keep cruising around until you find the closest available spot you pull into a space. Electrons don't really pull into a space, but it's, it's the same general idea. So what we need to have is we need to have a list of your subshells, uh, for our, or yes, your subshells, I guess, from the lowest energy up to the highest energy. And if I can do that, it's just a matter of just filling them in. It's pretty simple. All right, so how do I get that? Well, here's one way you can do it. One way is you can make a list of your energy subshells. So I can have a 1s, can have a 1p. No, only 2 and higher can have a p. Can have a 2s? Yes. Can have a 2p? Yes. Can have a 2d? No. 
only in two shells, 3 and higher can have a D, remember? 3S, 3P, 3D, can have a 3L. No, only 4 and higher can have an L. Are, are you seeing a trend here? Do you see that each successive energy shell has one more subshell than the last? Okay, so I can have a 4S, 4P, uh, 4D, and 4F, but no 4G. 5S, 5P, 5D, 5F, 5G, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so forth. All right, notice that all my S's are lined up this way. All my P's are lined up, my D's, my F's, and G's, and so on, and so on, and so forth. Could you generate a chart like this on your test up at the top? Because you can't write anything on your paper before I hand out the test. But after I hand out the test, you know, it's fair game. You can write anything you want to on your paper. Do you think you could do that? All right. By the way, watch this. How many electrons in an S? Two. So I can fit two electrons in the first energy shell. How many in an S? Two. How many in a P subshell? Six. Remember your three P orbitals? Two plus six is eight electrons in the second energy shell. Two in an S, six in a P, ten in a D. Two plus six is eight, plus ten is eighteen electrons in the third shell. Two, eight, ten, fourteen. Two plus eight is uh, ten. Ten plus ten is twenty. Twenty and um, fourteen. Oh, hang on, messed up there. Two plus six is eight. <laughs> eight and ten is eighteen. I thought that didn't sound right. 18 and 14 is 32 electrons in the fourth uh, energy shell. Yeah, we'll take care of that in uh, post edit, I guess. Um, and so, yeah, do you see how, remember that rule I gave you for the number of electrons in an energy shell? And we said it was 2n squared? Is it following that rule? Yeah, it's following that rule exactly. So, see what you've done right now is you're telling me, hey, there's, there's, uh, 18 electrons in the third energy shell. Two of those electrons are in the 3s, six of them are in the 3p, and 10 are found in the 3d. So see, you're, you're taking that shell and you're subdividing it into different subshells. See how it works? Okay, so if you can draw this little pyramid, little triangle looking thing here, now what you're going to do is you're going to draw diagonal arrows through this little triangle, like so. And the reason you're going to do that is what you're going to do is you're going to start with this first arrow up here, and every time you go through a subshell, you're going to write it down. So the first one I go through is 1s, the second I go through is 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s. All right? So far, all my 3s are above my 2s, and my 2s are above my 1s, and my s's are below my p's, and everything is working out nice and neat uh, the way it should be. Is that the way things usually work in here? Sometimes they don't, right? So what comes after, uh, four, after 4s? 3d. Here's a subshell. That, uh, that belongs to a lower energy shell, but yet the whole thing's higher energy than this 4s. So what's going on there? Well, the energy shell number is the primary factor that uh, determines the energy of an electron. Did I say it was the only factor? No, I said it was the primary factor. So generally speaking, a 4 is higher than a 3. Right? But the subshell number has a say too. And it turns out that a D is so much higher in energy than an S, it overwhelms the fact that 3 is less than 4. In reality, these two are actually pretty much the same energy. Right? But by convention, we write the 3D above the 4S. Okay, well maybe that was just a fluke. So let's, let's keep going. So after 3D, 4P, 5S. Everything's working out. What's after 5s? Up oh, 4d. Here we go again. 5p, 6s. What's after 6s? 4l. Here's a, an energy subshell that is two shells lower 
but still higher energy than this 6s. And it's because an elf is so much higher energy than an s. All right, what comes after 4f? Well, 5d, and then back to 6b, and then 7s, and then 5l, 6d, 7p, and then you don't need 8s. There is a practical limit how if you need to go, you have reached the limit. You can make it to 7p. All right, I'll explain why later. Uh, but yeah, this, this is your order of filling right here, and it's generated from this chart here. Notice the further up I go, the more things get messed up. Things are not in order anymore. So it's kind of like I had parking lots, but they kind of merged. They're not separate and distinct. So it's kind of like um, the science faculty parking lot over, over here outside this window and the health sciences parking lot. It's not really the health sciences. I don't know what you would call it. It's where the nurses are over on that side of the road. You know, it's all one big, giant, huge parking lot. So, you know, it's kind of hard to say when one ends and one, begin, one begins. Um, that's kind of what we've got, a situation here. You know, life is just kind of messed up, and that's just kind of the way it is. All right? If you try to memorize this, you will mess it up. I guarantee you, you'll mess it up. The best way to do it at this point is make your little chart, draw your little diagonal arrows, and generate it. You know, you'll probably be fine here, but when you get up to here, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get messy. You're probably going to mess it up. If you don't get the right order of filling, you can't do electron configurations. I don't care how good you are at them. If you don't have the right order of filling, it won't come out. So you've got to get that right order of filling. And this is probably the best way at this point to get it. Make sense? Okay. Well, now that we've got the order of filling, hey, let's start looking at electron configurations. So let's start out kind of simple. Let's go down here and let's look at oxygen. All right, if I look at oxygen in the periodic table, which I just happen to have one here, Amy, uh, it's right here, okay? It has an atomic number of eight, which tells me it has eight protons, and that also tells me it has eight electrons in a neutral atom of oxygen, right? So the question now becomes, where do those eight electrons go? Okay, well, we look at the 1s. How many electrons can I fit in an s? Two. Remember, one orbital, two electrons. That's that spherical shape. So we're going to write it like this. This is not 1s squared. The way you read this is 1s2. And that means there are two electrons in the 1s subshell. Okay? Now it's full. So what's after 1s? Well, 2s. How many electrons can I fit in the 2s? Not 4. 2. Any s subshell always holds 2 electrons. The sphere might be larger, but it still holds 2 electrons. And that's just kind of the way it is. So it doesn't matter if it's a 1s, 2s, 3s, 4s, 5s, 17s, 2 electrons and an s. Alright? So 1s2, 2s2. Okay, what's after 2s? Well, 2p. How many electrons can I fit in a P subshell? Well, 6. So it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, right? No. It's 2p4. Why is it 2p4? Well, because I said you can put a maximum of 6 in a P subshell. Does it have to have 6? No. You know, uh, the science fact, uh, well, the parking lot out here uh, for the Fox Science Building, let's say it holds 300 cars. I'll throw a number out there. Uh, can I park 150 cars in there? Sure I can. Can I park 50 cars? Yeah. Can I park zero cars in that parking lot? Yes, I can. Does the parking lot cease to exist if there are no cars in it? It's a very philosophical question. Uh, my guess is it's still there, it's just empty. Can I park 301 cars in there? No, because it only holds 300. So a P subshell can hold six electrons, but you don't have to put six electrons in there. We're only putting four in there. Why are we putting in four? Well, because we only have eight cars to park. See, we've only got eight electrons. So I've got two here, two here. How many do I have left? Well, I've got four left. So where do they go? They go into the two P. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. There's your electron configuration. Check your work.
take these numbers and add them up, they ought to add up to 8. 2 and 2 is 4, 4 and 4 is 8. There you go. Want to try one a little larger? Okay. Let's take a look at sulfur here. Okay, sulfur, if you look at the periodic table, has uh, 16 electrons in it. So uh, where are those 16 electrons in a sulfur atom found? Well, the first two go into 1s, so 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. Okay, after 3s2, where do I go? I go 3p. How many electrons do I need to put into that P? Remember, I only need 16 electrons. 2 and 2 is 4. 4 and 6 is 10. 10 and 2 is 12. So I need how many more? 4 more. 12 and 4 is 16. And so here is the electron configuration uh, for sulfur. Make sense? Okay. Take a look at the electron configuration for oxygen. Take a look at the electron configuration for sulfur. Okay. Look at the outer electrons here. Okay. Notice that the outer electrons in an oxygen atom are arranged 2s2, 2p4. Notice the outer electrons in a sulfur atom are arranged 3s2, 3p4. Look how similar that is. Hmm. Similar outer electron configurations. Remember, it's the outside electrons that are going to touch when things react. If oxygen and sulfur have a very similar outer electron configuration, would you expect them to react in a similar manner? You might expect them to react in a very similar manner. And in fact, they do. Because they have similar outer electron configurations. You see the correlation between the way the electrons are arranged around an atom, and how it reacts. And that's why we care about electrons as a chemist, because it gives us insight into chemical bonding. Let's take a look at the periodic table. Here's oxygen in the periodic table. Where do you find sulfur in the periodic table? Look at that. It's right below it in the same column. What do we call elements in the same column? Those are elements in the same group. What do we know about elements in the same group? It might be underlined with an asterisk by it in your notes. Elements in the same group have similar chemical reactivities. Why do elements in the same group have similar chemical reactivities? because they have similar outer electron configurations. And there you go. That's why electron configurations are important, because the way the electrons are arranged determine how certain substances or elements are going to react. And that's what elements in the same group have in common, similar outer electron configurations. That's why they react the same. Yeah, I told you I'd explain it someday. It just takes a moment. Want to see one a little bigger? Let's do one a little bigger. Here's silver. Silver has 47 electrons. Oh, this one might take a little bit more. All right. So here we go. Uh, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10. Remember, I can fit 10 electrons in a d sub, sub layer, sub shell. Back to 4p6. See, we're following our order of filling. 5s2. I can fit 10 electrons in a D subshell, but I need 4d9 here. Why 4d9? Because I've only got 47 electrons. Okay? Count these numbers across the top up. It should add up to 47. 2 and 2 is 4. 4 and 6 is 10. 10 and 2 is uh, 12. 12 and 6 is... 18, 18 and 2, 20, 20 and 10, 30, 30 and 6, 36, 36 and 2, 38, 38 and 9 is 47. 
and there are your 47 electrons and a silver atom. See, a little bit longer, but really all you're doing is, is you're simply just taking the number of electrons you've got, you've got the order of filling, you fill up the lower ones, and you just keep going until you run out of electrons. Kind of like in a parking lot. You just keep parking cars until you run out of cars. If you have the order of filling, you can do this. If you don't have the order of filling, you can't do this. So therefore, you need to be able to get the order of filling. That's kind of a, kind of a big deal. Okay? Now, side note here. If you look up the electron configuration for silver, you may find it's not 5s2,4,d9. What you may find is 5s1,4,d10. All right. Why is that the case? Well, this is something called half-shell stability that pops up on occasion. Uh, it turns out that if you fill up a, sub a subshell, that's a good thing. If you half-fill a subshell, that's also a good thing. So remember we talked about that 4s and that 3d being really close in energy. Sometimes it's so close in energy an electron will hop from the s over here to the d. Or sometimes even the d to the s, but typically it goes this way. All right, And that's exactly what happened here. One of these electrons hopped from this 5s2 into that 4d9. And that's where we got this from. Now, why would it do that? Do things just happen at random in here? Well, not usually, which is kind of nice. At least you have, that way you have a fighting chance of predicting it. There's got to be something to be gained here. So what is it to be gained? Well, by taking that electron out of the S and putting it into the D, you fill up this 4D. And notice that my 5S is now half full. And this energy state is actually lower in energy than this energy state. What you are writing is you're writing something called ground state electron configurations. Ground state means the electrons are in their lowest energy state, which is the way you expect to find them 99% of the time. Because atoms and molecules and electrons and students prefer to be in the lowest energy state possible. All comes back to that principle that we've been talking about all semester. Okay? Don't get too concerned about the half-shell stability thing. I don't expect you to be able to do that at this point. Uh, just realize if you look up electron configurations in a chart somewhere, it might look slightly different than what I have given you here, this order of filling. If it looks slightly different, it's probably a half-shell stability thing going on. Uh, for example, um, chromium. Uh, chromium is, uh, it ends up like S2, uh, D6, or S2, D4, S2, D4, or something like there's two in the outer S and four in the D. In reality, chromium is like S1D5. Uh, that electron promotes to get a half-filled D and also a half-filled S. All right, but then you have tungsten, which goes like 6S2, 4F14, um, 5D4. So, you know, uh, in the periodic table here, let's get you back over here. Uh, chromium does that. It's an S2D, uh, S1D5. Your molybdenum also does the same thing. But when you get to tungsten, it's back to S2D4. So you got an exception to the rule here, and then you got an exception to the exception to the rule. And we can play that game all day in here if you want to. We can play exceptions to exceptions to exceptions to the rules, but let's just not do that. All right, follow the order I gave you on the test, on your homework. You're going to be just fine. But if you see something that's a little weird and wasn't doesn't go exactly why, the way according to plan, it's probably that half shell stability thing. So I just mentioned that. In case uh, you happen to run into uh, that somewhere along the way. Okay? Well, that's kind of long, right? Aren't you glad we didn't do something like bismuth? Wow, that would take a lot, right? Well, that's a lot of writing. And do I really care so much about how these electrons are arranged? Well, not so much. I mean, yeah, it's nice to know. But, you know, those are not going to be the ones that participate in bonding. It'll be the ones on the outside that are going to touch, right? That's the important ones. So what I can do is I can write something called an abbreviated electron configuration. And the way you do abbreviated electron configurations is you go to the last noble gas that you pass before you get to that particular element. You put that in brackets, and then you write uh, the rest of the electron configuration. So if I'm dealing with silver, for example, Here's silver, so I go through the periodic table. The last one I get to is krypton. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to write Krypton in a bracket. And what that's going to do is that's going to take care of the first 36 electrons. It's got to be the last noble gas. You can't cheat. You can't put like palladium and then like a 4D1. It doesn't work that way. Got to be the last noble gas. All right. So, for example, if I want to do the abbreviated electron configuration for silver, I put krypton, and that takes care of the first 36. Essentially, it's these all the way to here. And then I start here, and that's 5s241. And that's a whole lot shorter than writing out the whole thing. All right, here's another one. Here's sulfur. You really don't need a abbreviated electron configuration for sulfur, but, you know, I'll show you how it works here. Uh, so here we go. The last noble gas before we get to sulfur in the periodic table, going through, is neon. All right, so we're going to put neon in a bracket that takes care of the first 10 electrons. And so therefore, sulfur is neon 3s23p4. This and this mean exactly the same thing. This is really useful when the uh, electrons, uh, when the electron configuration starts to get really long. Instead of writing out the whole thing, last noble gas in brackets, and then you go from there. Shortens it up quite a bit. Make sense? Okay. Where are the last electrons in a uh, titanium atom found? Well, there's two of them. They're in a 3D. Where are the last electrons in a selenium atom found? Well, there's four of them, and they're in a 4P. How about the last electrons in a cesium atom? Well, there's one of them that's in a 6S. How about this uranium down there? Well, that's, uh, that's 5F3. How am I doing that? Am I going through and doing electron configurations all the way up to 92 and realize I'm going to end up on 5F3? Am I really that smart? Or do I know a trick? Well, I know a trick. Turns out you can drive the electron configuration for any atom in the periodic table just by looking at the periodic table. Wow, how does that work? Well, let's take a look. Okay, so here is my highly stylized version of my periodic table. Okay, these first two columns over here, group one and group two, that's your alkali metals and your alkali earths, right here. Okay, this is called the S block of the periodic table. And what these elements have in common is their outer electrons are all found in an S sublevel. Here's the way it works you count down how many rows you are in, that's your energy uh, shell. You count. You're in the S block, so that tells you it's the S subshell, and then you count across, and that tells you how many electrons. So how many columns do I have in the S block? I have two columns. How many electrons can I fit in an S subshell? Two. That is not by coincidence. All right? So let's see how it works. Where are the outer electrons found in a calcium atom? Well, I'm one, two, three, four rows down, fourth period. I'm in the S block, so 4S, one, two across, 4S2. Write the whole thing out if you want to. I guarantee you're going to end up on 4S2. How about uh, sodium? Three down, one across, 3S1. Barium? One, two, three, four, five, six down, two across, 6S2. Potassium? 4s1, lithium 2s1, magnesium 3s2, 3 down, s block 2 across. See, that's pretty simple, isn't it? Why didn't I show you that first, right? Okay, we'll skip this little section right here. These are your transition metals. Remember we talked about those? Skip those for now and come over here to this side of the periodic table, except for helium here. This is called the P block of the periodic table. And elements in the P block have their outer electrons in a P subshell. And this works the same way. You count what period you're in, how many rows down, 
and then you're in the P block and you count across and that's how many electrons you've got. All right, so for example, how many columns do I have here in the P block? I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. How many electrons can I fit in a P subshell? Six. Again, not by coincidence. Okay, well, let's do one we've already done. We did oxygen, right? Okay, so where are the last electrons in oxygen atom found? Well, I'm in the P block. I am second row, so 2P, 1, 2, 3, 4, 2P, 4. All right, let's take a look at our notes. Is that where we ended up? Yeah, it sure is, 2P, 4. See? All right, how about sulfur? Well, here's sulfur. One, two, three rows down in the P block. One, two, three, four across, three P4. So two P4, three P4, four P4, five P4. You see why these elements in this column react very similar? Sure. See, similar electron configuration, similar chemical reactivity. And that's what elements in the same group have in common. Okay, they have the same what we call distinguishing electron. The distinguishing electrons are the electrons in the outer subshell. In the case of oxygen, it's 2p4. In the case of sulfur, it's 3p4. That's not even so important. All right? Elements in the same period. Remember, those are the rows. Uh, remember we said they had something in common? It wasn't as important as the group, but they did. I'm going to tell you that now. Elements in the same row have electrons in the same outer shell. So all the elements in period four have electrons in the fourth shell somewhere. All the ones in period three have, have electrons in the third shell, and so on and so on and so forth. So that's what the periods have in common. But the group thing is, is definitely much more important. Okay, calcium. Do you see why it's 4s2? Okay, you're in the S block. 4 down, 2 across, 4s2. Do you see why arsenic here is 4p3? Get over here. Right here. Fourth row down in the P block, 1, 2, 3 across. Do the electron configuration, I guarantee you're going to end up with 4p3. Okay? Okay. Do you remember these elements that we skipped here? And we call these our transition metals, right? Well, what they have in common is they have outer electrons in a D subshell. All right. How many columns do I have in my D subshell? I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. How many electrons can I fit in a D subshell? 10. Everything starting to come together a little bit better now? All right, now here's where it gets a little tricky. And this is actually why I showed you the little arrow method, folks. Yes, I am four rows down, but this offsets a little. The lowest energy shell that can have a D is three. So this is my 3D row, this is my 4D row, this is my 5D row, and this is my 6D row, all right? So it's, I'm four down, but three starts here, four, five, six. So it's a little offset. So it goes from 4S to 3D back to 4P. And if you're used to it, it's, that's not bad. If you're not used to it, it's kind of confusing. And so that's why I show you the arrow and the chart thing. It makes it a little bit easier. Okay? All right. Well, what about these down here? Your lanthanides and your actinides. This is the elf block of the periodic table. These elements have their outer electrons in an elf subshell. Lanthanium goes here, actinium goes here. Technically they kind of belong in, in that little space right there in the periodic table. Um, but this is the elf block. So ignore the lanthanium and the actinium for now. I have two rows, but if you start counting here, how many columns do I have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. How many electrons can I fit in an elf subshell? Yeah, you guessed it, 14. Okay? 
You start to see why the periodic table has the shape it has. It all comes back to those rules we've talked about. Uh, when we were talking about the shells and the subshells and the orbitals and the spin. Didn't seem to make any sense. Probably still doesn't, maybe. But, uh, yeah, it all does tie together eventually. It's just uh, maybe confusing, but at least it's consistent. This works the same way with this exception. The lowest energy shell that can have an elk is four. Only four and higher can have an elk. See, all of them can have an S, two and higher can have a P, three and higher can have a D, four and higher can have a D. If you ever forget which one does what, start with the S, P, D, and just work your way up, and you'll, you'll be able to tell which ones are which. So this is my 4F row, and this is my 5F row. All right, so for example, with uranium, ignore these for now. 5F, 1, 2, 3, 5F, 3. And that's how that works. Okay, on your notes there, we have erdium here, which you probably will never run into. But can you tell me where the outer electrons are in the erdium atom? Well, I'm in the 4F row. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Four F eleven. Okay. Hey, we did silver, didn't we? Where did we end up on? Four D nine. Let's check see if that works. Here's silver. Remember, this is my three D row. This is my four D row. One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, forty-nine, and that's where your outer electrons are formed. And you got that simply by looking at the periodic table. Make sense? In fact, I can actually give you the order of filling here simply by looking at the periodic table. I don't even have to look at this. You take a look at your notes and you tell me if what I tell you is exactly this. Here we go. 1s2. 2s2. 2p6. 3s2. So I'm in the s block, 3 down. 3p6. 4s2. Okay, now I'm in the d, but remember it's offset by 1. 3d10. Now back to the P block, so 4P6, 5S2, 4D10, 5P6. Okay, here's where it gets a little tricky. 6S2, but what we're going to do is we're going to go down here first, and then we're going to come back to here. So 6S2, the lowest L I can have is a 4. So 6S2, 4F14, 5P6. 6D10, 6P6, 7S2, down to here, 5F14, now back to the D block, so 3, 4, 5, 6, 6D10, and then back to 7P6. Is that exactly what you have written down in your notes? Yes, it is exactly what you have written down in your notes. I don't even have to go back. Now, why didn't I show you that first? Because that seems to me like it's a little bit cooler, right, than drawing errors on a piece of paper. Well, I don't show you that first because you, it gets tricky here. You know, you've got your, um, your 5S and then 4D, and then you're back to 5P, and it gets really bad here. 6S and then 4F14, and then back to 5D, and then back to 6P. If you're used to it, it's not bad. But if you've never done it before, it can get a little tricky. The nifty thing about the arrow thing is if you can draw a straight line, you can do the arrow thing. It's pretty much foolproof. Which way is quicker? Well, probably this way. You know, which way do I want you to do it? I don't care. I just want you to get the right answer. Whatever it takes to get to the right answer is what I want. So I would learn the arrow method first, and then, if you have time, I'd try to pick up on this. But when you're looking for the outer electrons in an atom, uh, yeah, just looking at the periodic table is a whole lot quicker. Okay? All right. About to quit here. Two last things. We're going to quit. We're going to save orbital diagrams maybe for the next one. Why does the periodic table have the shape it has? 
kind of a funny shaped little guy, right? I mean, we've got one and two way over here, got a big gap here. Do we need room for periodic table of the elements? Is that why there's a gap there? No. Look, this is my 4D, right? 4D, 3D, what would go right here? 5, 4, 3, this would be my 2D row, right? And this would be my 1D row. Why are there no elements there? Because there's no such thing as a 2D or a 1D. Only energy shells 3 and higher can have a D. And that's why that's below. Why is there nothing here except for helium? Because that's your 1P row. Only energy levels shells 2 and higher can have a D. Everything comes back to those rules that we gave you when we were talking about those shells and subshells and orbitals and spin that didn't seem to make any sense. They shaped the periodic table. These here actually belong here. In reality, if you want to do this right, you would split the periodic table right here. There would be a big gap between 20 and 21 and 38 and 39, and all 14 of those elements would actually fit right in here. The reason we cut them out and put them down here is so that my periodic table doesn't go off the screen. You know, it's too big. So we, and, and you don't really run into plutonium much unless you work at Los Alamos. So, yeah, we just kind of cut them out and put them down at the bottom. Their position in the periodic table is not as important as, like, phosphorus or sulfur. Uh, but, yeah, technically that's the way the periodic table ought to look. Okay? And it all comes back to those rules. Everything. Okay? All right. I'm going to close with this. What does a calcium atom look like? How many, how many protons does calcium have? Well, it's got an atomic number of 20. <clears throat> we'll deal with uh, calcium 40, we'll say. That's the mass number. Remember, that's the number of protons and neutrons. So if calcium has 20 protons, <clears throat> excuse me, um, starting to talk too much here, then uh, it has 20 neutrons as well. The, that's your mass number. adds up to 40. If it's got 20 pluses, that means it has 20 minuses, so it's got 20 electrons. So a calcium atom look, actually looks like this. You've got 20 protons and 20 neutrons all bundled together in the nucleus. Do you remember how we drew those 20 electrons in some sort of an electron cloud way back in Chapter 1? And I said we could do a little better than that. But here's how you do better. What does calcium look like? 1s2, 2s2, larger sphere. 2p6, see there's one orbital, there's the other, there's your little, P, your little um, jack shape there, you know. 3s2, larger s, 3p6, notice it's still a jack here, or a three-dimensional coordinate system, if you want to think of it that way, but it's a larger one, that's your 3p, 4s2. And that's what calcium looks like. Pretty, right? Well, if I had drawn that for you on day two, you probably would have gone running, screaming out of the room, right? So I guess that's why I didn't do it. Right? But uh, yeah, that's the best we can do at this point uh, in time. Uh, maybe you're teaching this stuff someday. You never know. Never thought I'd be teaching chemistry. I was a physics major. I thought I'd be a physics major physics person the rest of my life. Turned out I'm here in my office doing videos for chemistry. Okay. So you never know where you're going to end up in life. So it's important to pay attention no matter where you are. You might need that someday. You might not. You may never need this. But you might. Who knows? You may end up teaching it. And maybe when you teach it, maybe there's a better theory that works better than what we can do today. But at this point, this is as far down the road as I can take you. This is the current theory for how the electrons are arranged around an atom. Um, and I can't take you much further than that, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, that's what that's the best we can do with it, what a calcium atom actually looks like. So yeah, there are regions of space in the electron cloud where the electrons are more likely to be, but I can't pinpoint them any more than that. 
All right? The world's a very complicated place. You're probably finding that out, aren't you? Okay? All right. Well, next time, two things to, to talk about here. Number one, we're going to talk about something called orbital diagrams. And orbital diagrams show you even more information about the electrons around them than they have. Okay. And um, another thing that we haven't really talked about yet is, do you remember we were talking about the noble gases? And we said there was something kind of magical. There we go. Something kind of magical about having 2, 10, 18, 36, 54, 86 electrons. Do you remember we talked about that? And we said those were the magic numbers that made the atom really stable and didn't react, so it didn't react with anything. And we said the others didn't have that. What's so magical about those numbers? Are they really magic, or is there something else going on here? We'll talk about that, too. All right, and hopefully, cross your fingers, we're going to try to finish Chapter 2 with the next video, because I've already run, like, 46 minutes on this one. So I guess I need to quit so you can uh, get some sleep or food or watch your favorite TV show, whatever you want to do. So that's number two uh, in the can. And so uh, be looking for number three, which is going to be coming up uh, really shortly after this one. So I guess goodbye for now.